months ago looking real good in my passport photo oh, no. amateur traveler episode 812 today the amateur traveler talks about jagged peaks and alpine meadows castles and mountain huts and a strong sense of deja vu as we go back to the south tyrol and to the dolomites Welcome to the Amateur Traveler. I'm your host, Chris Christensen. Let's talk about the South Tyrol of Italy. I'd like to welcome to the show Lynn Neiman from the Wonder Your Way podcast and wonderyourway.com, who's come to talk to us about South Tyrol. Lynn, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. I'm very happy to be here. I almost welcomed you back to the show because we have done a recording before, but it wasn't for my podcast. It was for your podcast. So we actually have an episode that's going to be coming out on Lynn's podcast, I think in a week. Oh, a couple days um, from when we're doing this. A couple days. Okay. About doing barge cruising in Southern France, which we've talked about on Amateur Traveler a few years back, but... Excellent. Yeah. We're talking about South Tyrol today. Can you put it on a map for us? Because this sounds like it's part of Austria, but yeah, that is not like the case. No, it's not. It's actually part of Italy. Mm-hmm. It is the part that borders Austria, hence the name. And it used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire prior to World War I. So that's how it got its name, because it really was part of that Tyrolean region. So just the southern part. And so Italy was awarded this piece of the Austro-Hungarian Empire after they switched sides and went to the winning side. And after World War I, I can only imagine like how confused these people probably were because once they were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now you're part of Italy. So German is spoken first. It is the province. The whole region is the Trentino Alto Adige region. Mm-hmm. And that Alto Adige part, also called South Tyrol or Sud Tyrol, is the northern part of that greater region. It's that northern province, if you will, with Anno or Bozen being the sort of like provincial capital in the main city. It's an area just filled with lots of mountains and natural beauty. And let's get into there. Why would somebody go to South Tyrol? <laughs> That's what I would say is probably going to be geared more towards people who do want to be in the outdoors, or at least you don't have to be some sort of hardcore hiker or skier or something like that. But even somebody that just appreciates the great outdoors, appreciates beautiful mountains, the Dolomite peaks are there. And of course, the Dolomites are also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There's nine total Dolomite parks. And I think six of them are in the greater Trentino Alto Adige region and I think there's maybe three or four of those that are specifically in South Tyrol so it's a great place to appreciate the landscape or get out into the landscape get out into the mountains there's beautiful charming villages there's lots of castles believe it or not so that's another feature if you're a big city person this is not your place But if you like the small, charming towns, some historical sites, and a beautiful natural landscape, then South Tyrol is for you. And we have done an episode on South Tyrol before. It's just been a while. But also, this is going to be an odd one because we also did an episode on South Tyrol last week in the time period from those of you who were listening. But that's going to be quite different because that was a long-distance hiking episode. And Lynn, I'm guessing you are not going to take us long distance hiking on the Alta Via one. Otherwise, we no. probably shouldn't do this. <laughs> I suspect no. we're going to be doing more wine tasting and looking at castles. So wine, yeah, wine tasting, <laughs> some hiking though, but more day hiking. Exactly. More just let's go do this for the day and then let's come back into town and let's have a nice meal and a nice glass of wine and yeah, and that type of thing. So there will be some overlap, but if you listen to Lynn and you think, I want to do more hiking than that, go back a week and listen to that episode. (laughs) Great. Excellent. What kind of itinerary are you going to recommend for us? There's two towns that I'll recommend. And the first town is called Kestelroto or Kestelruth in German. And the second town is San Vigilio di Marebe. And I don't think it really has as much of a German one. That one tends to be a little bit more Italian. So Castel Roto is just about 20 miles or so from Balzano, from the motorway. Okay. So it's pretty easy to get to. I would say a car is ideal here, but you don't necessarily need a car. 
there's actually pretty good bus service in the area. Okay. That and surprises me, actually. Yeah, yeah. It is surprising, but you can get there. I think having a car gives you, obviously, a little bit more freedom to go mm-hmm. like when you want to go and to be able to also maybe take some drives. So the Castle Roto town, there's a couple other little towns around there. There's one called Susi Alociliar, and I think there's another one called Fial Alociliar. It's F-I-E, so I'm not really sure how that's 100% pronounced in Italian. But these three towns are together. You'll pass through them. But Castle Roto is the one that I would recommend because it's a little bit bigger. There's a couple of supermarkets there and things like that. There's a plethora of places to stay. Anything from a basic sort of B&B, Garney type place up to like posher hotels. There's lots of apartments if you want to do have your own kitchen and things like that. Lots of holiday apartments there. And the reason you want to go there is for the Alpi di Susi. So up above the town, there's something called the Alpi di Susi, or I guess it's Seisser Alm in German. And you can either take the bus up or you can take the gondola up. You can drive up the road. They do close the road at a certain time, like in the mornings. And if you beat that time, you are going to have to pay pretty pretty hefty. If you go up and park up there, it's pretty expensive to park up. And there's a town up there, a village called Campaccio. Okay. And that's where the gondola would take you. That's If you take the bus up, that's where you would get off the bus. But the Alpi di Susi is basically this high alpine meadow and it's just beautiful. It's pretty popular. There's, mm-hmm. you can, there's this, it's a ski area too in the winter. So you'll ski, see little ski lifts ar- around there too. But in summer, it's just blanketed with flowers. And it is mm. just beautiful. All kinds of colors. You've got the one peak, the Shiliar or the Schlern at one end. You've got a bunch of the Dolomite peaks over on the other side. And then there's the Sasso Piatto and the Sasso Lungo also there. And there are these distinctive peaks of the area. And the hiking up there is fairly easy. That's why I Mm -hmm. say you don't have to be like a hardcore hiker. There are also little mountain huts where you can get something to eat (laughs) or drink. (laughs) So it makes it's very, it's all very, it's not primitive. Let's just put it that way. It's all very, very European. (laughs) Well, and you say the peaks and I feel like I've just said this on a show recently, but the Dolomites I think are just some of the most spectacular mountains, they are very jagged peaks that we're talking about here that look like there's a fair amount of uplift involved in terms of geologically. But when you've seen the Dolomites, you won't confuse them with other mountains. Let's just say that. Absolutely. Agree. 100%. Yeah. And these are definitely some distinctive ones that you'll see up there. The Schlern or the Shiliar is definitely, you'll see that actually even from when you would get on the gondola. I really recommend taking the gondola up to the Alpi di Susi. It's a little bit more expensive. The bus is actually cheaper, but the gondola is just, it's fun being on the gondola and just taking that up. And then you get off up at this settlement at Campaccio. And then from there, the trails just fan out. And you can even get a bike. You can get an e-bike. They have places to rent e-bikes up there. Mm If you want to do something like that, it's like I said, the hiking up there is fairly easy. There's a few harder ones. Like you can go up on and hike like up on top of the Shiliar. You Uh can go up. There's definitely some harder ones, but a lot of it's easy. I've seen people of all shapes and sizes, people with kids up there hiking. Some of them are paved. Some of them are big, wider roads. There is a bus system that actually runs up there too. So if you go way out somewhere, then you can just buy a ticket and you can make your way back to the main settlement of Campaccio where you either would then take the bus or the gondola back down. Just a wonderful place. Like I said, it's because I think it's easier. It's a good place for a lot of people to go. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, it looks like you're going to run into Heidi from the (laughs) books of my childhood here as you're up in this high alpine vista, this high alpine uh, meadows here. Yeah, it it really is beautiful. Now, it's interesting. A couple, few summers ago when I was there, I think it was 2019, I ran into a couple, and I think they lived in Germany. Like he was American, but he had been living in Germany for a long time. I think he married a German. Mm -hmm. racist kids and he said this is where we taught our kids to ski they went there but he said it was so different there's so many more people that go there so it is pretty popular 
you do see some Americans, maybe not a ton. You see a lot of Germans just because they can go into South Tyrol and they don't have the language barrier right. because it's people more speak German to them. And you'll see a lot of the Italians come up for summer vacation for summer holidays it can be busy i think september's nice i've been in september in a couple times and you start to maybe get the colors to turn a little bit and it gets a little quieter that would be one piece of advice i would give is june's not so bad july and august are going to be pretty busy and then september will start to taper off and i would also say that you have to watch like going into October because some places will start to close down. Like I think about, I used to live in Colorado for, so I think about like ski places. A lot of times they close in the latter part of autumn and they're closed in the spring because it's mud season. And so they're open more summer and winter. Okay. Yeah. Anything else we wanted to say about the Alpi de Susi or about you had home based us in Castel Roto. Castro, Castel Roto. Yeah. But there is the town of Castel Roto, the church there. You definitely want to pop in there. Mm-hmm. They also sometimes have a little farmer's market. I think they do it on Fridays. And you'll get the farmers bringing in their food from around, especially if you get, again, towards the latter part of summer into fall, when you get like a lot of the fruits and things like that that come in. So that might be something that you might want to consider there. There is a castle. It's called Prossel's Castle. If you are driving up from the motorway and driving up from Balzano up to Castel Roto, you would see it. You can tour it. I think one of the problems with some of the castles around there and trying to tour things is they don't always have tours in English. It's German okay. and Italian. So you need to watch that. You still may be able to go and tour it and at least maybe pick up on a few things or you, they may give you like something that's in English that you can follow along with a little bit. But there are a lot of castles up in the area and that's one that is nearby that you may want to check out. And there's all these cute little churches that have these onion domes. So San Valentino is one that's right in between Susi Alosiliar and Castle Roto. Then there's San Constantino, which is further like back towards Balzano. They're just cute little places. They're only open at certain times, so sometimes it's hard to get into them, but they're lovely for photos. <laughs> So if you just want to take your camera and and get this cute little church and blue sky and the mountains or something like that in the background, it's... And you say cute little churches. I just happened to come across a blog post on Wander Your Way about this this town in the Dolomites here with these buildings that have painted cherubs on them and autumn scenes and things like that. I believe the author of this piece called it charming as hell. (laughs) <laughs> that sounds about right yeah yeah do take a walk around like Castel Roto any of the towns you'll see sometimes you'll run across that but Castel Roto definitely has a few little places where there are these just like these random paintings on the sides of the buildings so everything's very neat and tidy it's very sort of mm-hmm. Swiss slash Germanic I think in this area of Italy so yeah excellent where to next So what I would recommend as far as, I don't know if I would stay here. There's a quick little detour I would take from there. And that is up by the Puez Odol um, Dolomite Park. There is a little town called Santa Maddalena. And there's a lot, speaking of churches, there's a lovely little church up there by the same name, Santa Maddalena. And it sits right there at the base. And then you've got these big, the Odol peaks are there. This is another of the Dolomite parks that you can visit. The hiking in there will get a little bit more challenging in that park. But you mm-hmm. can visit this little village. And you can actually walk up to the church. This church I think you can go into. And then from there's a little trail that you can, it doesn't go up too high. It just goes up a little bit. And then you get the view back for the photos of the church okay. and the valley and the peaks in the background. It's, that's the Val de Funes, F-U-N-E-S. And it's a lovely spot. It's just a little bit north of where you are in Castel Roto. So it makes a nice little maybe day trip from Castel Roto. So that would be something else that I might recommend throwing in there. The other place that I would base myself if you wanted to do like maybe a few nights in Castel Roto and a few nights somewhere else, I would recommend a place called San Vigilio di Marebe. It's a mouthful, but it is... It's much smaller, I would say, than Castel Roto. It has just one little market. Again, a beautiful church in the center of town. 
but it is the base for the Thanos, Senus, Braeus, Dolomite Park. This is one of the spectacular Dolomite parks in this region. And the town, like I said, it's also a ski town that mm-hmm. definitely gets very busy during the ski season. There, it's more of a village. It's fun though, because in the center of the village, sometimes you'll see the cows like in the middle of the, there's like a pasture area. <laughs> okay, and there's the right. cows right there. And then there's little settlements around there. You can either take a bus or if you have your car, you can drive. And about, I think it's about maybe 10 kilometers. I don't know if it's 10 kilometers or 10 miles now that I'm thinking about that. But mm-hmm. you take this road and it goes to an, a place called Pedaru, P-E-D-E-R-U. They call it a mountain refugio there. Mm -hmm. And from there, you can take some nice hikes. So you can go to the Senna's Hut or you can go to the Fanna's Hut. And they're both kind of uphill hikes. So you have to have some sort of conditioning. But once you get up to a certain level, then you get these spectacular views. So the Senna's hike will take you it's pretty much of a slog up up a lot of switchbacks the beginning but it's not that long it's maybe i think it's only maybe a six miles round trip up to the hut you can actually stay up in the senis refugio the senis hut or if you want you just do a day hike which is what i did the first time i hiked up to the hut there's a restaurant you can have a meal you can have a drink you can enjoy the views the views from up there are spectacular this particular park, Fanacetta Spreus, also butts up against the Tina d'Ampezzo. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but there's another Dolomite park that sits just in that way northern part of the Veneto region, mm-hmm. and they butt up together. So you can actually hike into that other park as well. But if you just hike up to the hut, you'll have views all around you, 360 of these gorgeous Dolomite peaks. It's absolutely stunning. If you wanted to go and experience staying in a mountain hut, you could do that as well. You could just hike up and they've got rooms, they've got dorm rooms, single room, shared room. If you're a group of three or four people, you can do that. We talked about this a little more last week that hut is a bit of a misnomer for what we're talking about here. They're really a mountain lodge. We're talking about like a four-story building that is bringing up fresh food from the valley floor or wherever they are there makes it sound like something a little more rustic yeah and they're not your room might be basic but you still have sheets and a blanket and a dresser and things like that like i had a little single room when i stayed up there and i had Mm -hmm. a little dresser and i had a little single bed and i had a view out the window across to the peaks and I had a shared bathroom, but then you'd go downstairs and you'd have these awesome meals of really good food. You can go and spend the night or you can do that as a day hike. You can certainly hike further if you want. But the hike, that is, to me, it's even though it's a bit of a, it's it's not real pretty in the beginning of going up. It's a lot of switchbacks and you have the views down to that Petaru Valley. But once you get up so far and you start to get the views from like up more towards the hut and see all these beautiful peaks all over, including the Crota Rosa, which is one of my favorite Dolomite peaks. It's definitely very pink, hence the name Rosa. Just absolutely gorgeous. So I would highly recommend doing that hike. And then you go the other way. You go up to Fanus and you go up to the Fanus hut. The hike up, it's not as intense, I would say, but it does climb up a little bit. It's a little less mm, steep, I would say. And you can go up there. And again, you've got this wonderful Fanus hut. There's another little hut system, lodge system, if you will, nearby. And you can even go beyond that, which I've done a little bit too. And again, just beautiful views. So the Fanus Senna Spreus Nature Park is definitely one that's good for hiking. It's a little more difficult than what you would find in the Alpi du Susi, but okay. definitely worthwhile. The other thing that this park is known for, and <laughs> full confession, I haven't been to this lake yet, but that's Lago di Breas. And mm-hmm. if you've probably seen it, maybe some of your listeners may have even been there. I just haven't get, gotten there yet, but you could get there from San Vigilio di Marebe. It's a very popular lake, Mm -hmm. so I would probably recommend going like earlier in the day or later in the day, but it's just this gorgeous color of green and easy walks then around the lake. So if you're not into doing as much of that, you could certainly go or just take a picnic and go sit by the lake and enjoy that. 
Excellent. I feel like we should be getting some money that someone should have basically paid me to support South Tyrol here in two shows in a <laughs> row and talking about these lovely things. But I think our listeners will enjoy these destinations if they should take them, should try yeah. them out. Yeah, there are definitely some good places. And the other spot, again, that you might want to think about going is there's an, the Abbey, it's Novacella, and it's up beer near Brissone or Brixen. And again, that could be a stop maybe or a day trip. Like I did as a day trip from Castel Roto. Uh-huh. I think there's a lot of good places that you can get to from Castel Roto that, that kind of make it pretty easy. And you can go up. It's almost like a little village there. Okay. You can, I think, again, you may have to have a, at least a group of 10 people to be able to get an English-speaking tour. But you can certainly still go and check it out. They also have a vineyard, so you can do wine tasting there, and the wine. There we go. I, I thought you were going <laughs> to let me down here, Lynn. But. Nope, <laughs> we were getting to it. So yeah, so they have some really good, some really good wines there. So it's a, it's it would be an excellent place to take in this beautiful abbey and learn a little bit about some of that history there, and then go on a wine tour and tasting. I'm gonna guess because we're a little higher up and a little cooler, white wines. Both. The thing about all of the Tyrol area is mm-hmm. that they produce both, and there certainly would be some other vineyards that I would recommend that I think further south from here. But you'll get your whites, you'll get things like your Pinot Bianco and Pinot Grigio, but then you get some of the Austrian slash German kind of okay. wines, like Sylvaner or Sylvaner, the Müller. What's it called? I have to look this one up. It's Muller Thurgord. Thurgord. I always forget how to pronounce. <laughs> Muller Thurgau would be it. And you can't, and you will get like Sauvignon Blanc and, yeah, and yeah that's okay. it. You will get Sauvignon Blanc and some Chardonnay different. Now the red wines okay. though, you'll get something called Schiava, which is very much local to the area. You might see, also see it as Vernach. It's a very light red, but it's a very good um, hmm. I highly recommend that one. We they don't do know that one. very nice Pinot Noirs. And the, and then there's l- the Lagrine, which is it's almost like a purple color. You'd think it'd be like really heavy, but it's not. It's probably like medium bodied, but it's very good. Those would be some of the wines that you might want to check out. And there's really, there's vineyards all over the place. And the food as well. I would say I tend to eat more vegetarian, at least at home. I will eat a little bit of meat. But you'll get things like the speck, which is their cured meat of the area, which is really good. I do. Which would be a a pork, I think. I think you're right. Yes, it is. And then you get like Tyrolean dumplings and you'll get some sort of take on some sort of pasta. Like I've had some interesting, like almost a ravioli type stuff. Very good cheeses as well because of all the cows. There's lots of cows. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And... As we know in California, happy cows make good cheese. So exactly, that, at least according to <laughs> the California Dairy Council. So yeah, yeah. I I so. would think these would be happy cows. So yes, very much so. You hear the clanging of the bells and the wind, and that's always one of my favorite things. <laughs> that's a nice thing. Like up in Alpe di Susi, there will be cows up there as well. So uh-huh. you'll see them up there through the summer and into early autumn, and then they of course bring them down as the weather starts to turn. But yeah, it's, I think that those couple of places, Castle Roto and then San Vigilio di Marebe are two, they're two of my favorite places mm-hmm. for different reasons. They're, they're very different, but I think that they make good bases because of some of the things that you can do in the areas. Huh. Um, the one thing too, there is a wonderful drive in between. If you, especially if you're going from San Vigilio di Marebe over to Castel Roto, you would want to take the drive over Paso Gardena. So it takes you into the Val Gardena, which is like the other side of Castel Roto. It's where little towns called Santa Cristina and or TC are. And uh-huh. that drive though, oh, stunning if you have good weather and you're going in june through maybe even may through like maybe early october it's like one of the most beautiful drives i think in the area it's just a beautiful pass i'm guessing you're going to want to be someone who likes driving curves 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as you're like okay with mountain driving. And mm -hmm. again, that it's not for everyone. If mm -hmm. that's something that kind of freaks you out, then no, don't do it. But if you're okay with that, then I lived in Colorado for 15 years, so I got used to it. The reason I wanted to bring that up is that I do enjoy that kind of thing. My father, who had even, I think, a little more acrophobia than I have, used to drive those mountain roads many times in the national parks in the U.S., and he would be a little more nervous about those. And apparently it didn't help that he had two sons in the back seat saying, oh, dad, look how far down it is. That was not helpful, we were told. <laughs> no, so. no, probably not. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, I would say you just have to be aware. Uh, there's actually a lot of cyclists that do this. Yeah. That do that, okay. that do it. So you just have to, you have to watch out for the cyclists, especially right. obviously like in the middle of summer, that's when they're typically out. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a lot of people on motorcycles as well. So you just have to watch out because they, sometimes they just drive way too fast. So <laughs> especially the Italians. <laughs> Excellent. And then if you had more time and you were in this region, Obviously, there's a couple different things in the area that would make an interesting add-on to this. You're not far from either Venice or Slovenia or Innsbruck, Austria. You're in that triangle in between those and not all that far from Milan. So this could be an addition to your trip to Verona or to Trieste Verona. or wherever. And we've yeah. done shows on all of those areas. Yeah. There is one other little place that I want to mention. I only mm -hmm. was there once, but it would be something that you could do a day trip from Oregon, if you wanted to stay there, a day trip from San Vigilio di Marebe, and that's a little town called Campo Turres. So it's nor it's almost up to the Austrian border. It's not far from Co. And you want to go somewhere that's definitely off the tourist track. This is it. It's a beginning of, there's that, the, I would say the main town. It's also called Sand and Toffers. There's a beautiful castle there, mm. Berg and Toffers. And it, it's at the beginning of this valley called the Valley Arena, A-U-R-I-N-A. And you can just make a drive up there. The road, I think, just dead ends. There's a bunch of little hamlets that you'll hit as you drive up through that valley. It's just beautiful. Now, the mountains around there are not considered the Dolomites. They're called the, the Zillertal Alps. Okay. So they kind of spill over from Austria. But again, it would be like if you were looking for somewhere where you're not going to find any Americans that's the place because I ran into some Americans on a trail there, but mm -hmm. they were with friends from like Austria or Germany or whatever. So that's the only way they were there. Everybody else, nobody spoke English. Up there, there. So it was more definitely German first and then Italian. The castle itself is, I took the tour. I had to do a tour in Italian and they gave me like a little cheat sheet, but at least I got to see the inside of it because <laughs> okay. it sits up like on this ledge sort of thing and it just lords over the little town. And then again, there's, I took a gondola up to do some hiking and one trail. And then I know that one day there's a trail that actually runs along the stream that you could just w walk and it would take you into the Valley Arena and to these little towns. And that was just a flat walk. And a lot of people were cycling on that as well. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely a place that would be off the tourist track. I had this indication that this was off the tourist track, some of these destinations you're naming, because as I'm looking for them so that I can put them in the show notes, I'm finding your post is <laughs> quite often number one or number two. Congrats on finding some <laughs> um, not as popular destinations, but yeah. just gorgeous. Yeah, it really is. If you've never been to South Tyrol, I highly recommend it. And again, I would say you don't have to be an avid outdoors hiker or something like that. You can get in the car and take some wonderful drives and stop in these little towns and maybe just get out for some easy walks just to stretch your legs and then have some good food and good wine and be on your merry way to the next spot. Excellent. Again, we have more information on this destination. If you want to learn more about the cheese, the last time we had an episode on South Tyrol, we were talking with the people from cheeseweb.eu. <laughs> and so there's a little more emphasis on that. If you want to hear more about hiking, just go back last week. As we start to wind this down, actually, one other question. I mentioned some possible things that I would do if I wanted to extend this vacation, what would you go to if you had two more days? Oh, I think it makes 
sense to either do Verona or Venice. I'm okay. and I'm probably a fan of Verona, Verona, even though I've I've actually only been to both places like once mm-hmm. <laughs> each time, a couple of days. But I really like Verona. I think because it's a little Venice is just. Venice is definitely worth seeing, but it's inundated with <laughs> lots of people. Verona sure. gets that way too, but go to the arena. If you can see a show in the arena in Verona. The old Roman. The old Roman theater, the old mm-hmm. Roman arena. They do Shakespeare stuff, opera in the summer. I saw a, an Italian pop star there on my trip. My B&B host actually got a ticket for me. I didn't know who she was, but it was just so much fun. It was so cool to be in this old Roman theater and Mm -hmm. taking in a show. I think Verona is one of those places. It's a lovely city. And you'll get good wine there, too, because you're down near the (laughs) Policello wine region. Excellent. So, (laughs) So, yeah. As we go to wind this down, you are standing in the prettiest spot in the Dolomites. Where are you standing? What are you looking at? Oh, you're making that. Or in South Beach, expand it. (laughs) Yeah, gosh. I guess I would say being in, oh, there's, I I got two places, but let's go with with Albi D. Susi, just standing maybe right in the middle where I can see both the Schlern and then the Sasso Piatto and the Sasso Lungo, and there's just wildflowers all over the place. Blue sky, sunshine, so it's summer. The flowers are every color, yellows and violets and oranges and green grass. And I'm hearing the sound of the clanging cowbells in the air and, yeah, hearing the buzzing of some bees. That would be one of my top picks for sure. What was the other one? I'm curious. The other one would be, and it's probably going back to a little bit of a memory, but it would probably be at Senna's Hut, at Senna's Refugio, Got at, sun, at sunset. The Just watching the light, the sun go down, and how the light changed on the peaks as the sun got lower. And the Dolomite peaks already have a pale, almost pinkish hue to them. Mm-hmm. So to have that setting sun just make them become even warmer and pinker and redder is just beautiful. And then watching as the, maybe the moon starts to come up and the stars start to come out. That's a pretty spectacular sight to see that and just see the shadows just coming across all the big peaks as the light fades away. And Excellent. you get cold and you get cold because <laughs> <laughs> sure. it's chilly up there. So you We're bringing in a coat. <laughs> yeah, so bring in a coat for One sure, th- even in summer. One thing that makes you laugh and say only in South Tyrol. Oh, wow. I'd probably say like German and Italian somehow getting mixed together, like hearing people, hearing the locals switch very easily from one to the other. It's you're hearing both languages. It's oh, you're hearing Guten Morgen and Buongiorno all in kind of one breath. So it's typical Excellent. of the area. And if you had to summarize South Tyrol in just three words, what three words are you going to choose? Let's see. Let's say unique. Okay. This is going to be two words, but naturally beautiful. Okay. So I kind of had to put the two together and breathtaking. Excellent. Our guest again has been Lynn Neiman from wonderyourway.com and their Wander Your Way podcast. Lynn, I've got links to a number of your posts already in the show, (laughs) so maybe I don't need to ask you what your best post is, but you also will help people plan their trips because you actually do travel agent kind of things as well. I do. So, and especially if you're looking to go to this piece of Italy, I would love to help you plan your trip. Terrific. And you can find Lynn again at wanderyourway.com. Lynn, thanks so much for coming on Amateur Traveler, again, I want to say back on Amateur Traveler, coming on Amateur Traveler and sharing with us your love for Italy and for the South Tyrol. Thanks, Chris. As always, a special thanks to the patrons of the show who help support Amateur Traveler financially. If you're interested in learning more about becoming a patron of the show, go to patreon.com slash amateur traveler. In yet more evidence that Amateur Traveler has the smartest audience in the world and that they will sometimes call me out on things, I heard from Andreas about the episode we did back in 770 on Adelaide. 
and said thanks for taking me back to Adelaide where I spent three months on student exchange in 1992. Shout out to Concordia College. But I do have to weigh in on Captain Hahn controversy because I was surprised when you, Chris, said that he was Danish, not German, because the name is clearly German. What happens is that he was born on the island of Sylt, which had semi-autonomy within the Danish kingdom and became part of Prussia in 1866 after Hans' death. So it may well have been that he was a Danish citizen, but ethnically and linguistically he was most probably German or Prussian. He also sailed on a German ship and took German settlers to South Australia. Before the time of nation states, I always find it a bit tricky to say that someone was of this or that citizenship, especially so when it comes to multi-ethnic empires or, like in the case of Germany, to countries that simply didn't exist at the time. Germany as a nation state was only established in 1871 after Hans' death. However, that doesn't mean that the people didn't have a notion of being German before, or at least since the failed revolution of 1848 and even more so in that fraught region which gave us the famous Schleswig-Holstein question. Until today, there is a German minority in Denmark and a Danish minority in Germany, both protected by laws and treaties. I touch on this in my report about a very long train ride from Germany to Sweden to close on a travel-related note. And Andreas has a link that I'll put in the show notes to a blog post. With that, I think we'll end this episode of Amateur Traveler. If you have a question, send an email to host at amateurtraveler.com or better yet, leave a comment on this episode at amateurtraveler.com. And thanks so much for listening. I got to see one more.